They know what to do with the money, but where is the democratic development? Where is the prosperity of the people? So my point is that uh, security and democratization are important elements, but in order to make policy, policy effective, uh, we should be very precise in determining uh, their parameters uh, in every particular case, not to apply one size fits to all cases. Thank you. Thank you, Valeri, for uh, all the emphasis in your contribution. Uh, among other, among other things, your uh, uh, your application of uh, Switzerland on the Balkans paradigm uh, into our discussion. Uh, so uh, uh, let's move then. Uh, let's move then to the presentation of uh, Mr. Basam Al Kuatli, because uh, uh, time is uh, running out and we need to. Spare some time for discussion. Please, Mr. Kotli, you have the floor. Dobar den. Mogu mi prijatno da bude tu kao među vas. I'll switch to English. I'll, I'll make sure to speak slowly so I'm not added to the assassination list of the translators. Uh, uh, on <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll go back into history of Syria just briefly to clarify uh, one point. Uh, during the French mandate of Syria, uh, which ended in 1946, the French tried to divide current Syria into five countries or regions. This did not succeed because of the presence of strong elite in all those small states which refused uh, this division and worked against it and at the end ended with the current Syria. Uh, what happened later on, we had a brief period of democracy, came military coups, we ended with the Ba'ath regime for the last 50 years. What the Ba'ath regime did, differently from any occupation or anything which happened to Syria, is destroying the local elites, destroying the social fabric of the country, destroying basically any uh, group which can maintain coherence to the society. Uh, now, with the time, the regime was able, with the combination of destruction of the elite, removing them, and uh, brutal force to maintain itself and power for 50 years, uh, until recently where young people, uh, empowered by Facebook, Skype, uh, Twitter, small tools, but very powerful, uh, so what happened in Tunisia, so what happened in uh, Egypt, and were inspired. They wanted to be like everybody else. Everybody else was living in Europe, uh, people who you know, uh, had changed here in Bulgaria and uh, Eastern Europe. And they went out uh, asking basically t for a change, for a democratic state. They were looking basically, the biggest slogan, the main slogan was Shab Suri Wahid, which means the Syrian people are one. Uh, they really didn't look into dividing the country or into uh, issues uh, such as empowering certain groups and so on, even though the regime was building its power on minority rule. Uh, and, you know, I, I'll, I'll be careful of uh, describing it as totally sectarian because the minority who was ruling was not really benefiting with the exception of the few. It was just utilized as a tool for uh, oppression. Uh, the regime very fast tried two te techniques. Uh, first technique is to militarize the revolution, learning from the 80s experience of uh, the, uh, Assad, the father. Uh, and the second technique to break the fabric, again, the technique which is very familiar with. Uh, they released from prison uh, criminals, uh, extremists, Islamic extremists, knowing very well that those people are going to go out and start calling for their own slogans uh, or will start uh, stealing and uh, breaking the law will ref give a bad reputation to what was happening to the revolution. The uh, regime was very smart, rational. Uh, the opposition uh, unfortunately failed in portraying a new vision for Syria, uh, political laziness in a way. Uh, or of a reliance on uh, things moving naturally, the regime falling at one period, on other period of a reliance on Western intervention on behalf of the revolution, and none of this uh, has realized. Uh, 
naturally people started. Uh, the other thing which the opposition did, uh, I'm not sure, you know, I can't describe it as well. At, uh, it had many choices, is to go and seeking foreign uh, help to get it from powers which are interested in fighting their own wars on the Syrian soil. So we had, all of a sudden we've ended with Syria being a field for external powers, Iran from one side, Saudi Arabia from other side, Russia, Qatar, and everybody fighting their own small wars on the Syrian soil, very similar to what happened in Lebanon before. Uh, people naturally went back to their small uh, protection areas to basically behind their small walls, behind their identities, and went back basically to seek protection in you know, there are groups, Christians together, Muslims together, Sunni together, Shia together, uh, Kurds, and, and so on. Uh, so you see basically currently in Syria two trends, trend of those young people which still really want one Syria, united Syria, which give equality to everyone, give the rights to everyone, and this trend of people who are fearful of uh, the other, fearful of the change, what it will bring, and basically uh, trying to protect themselves and get some gains for their own group, uh, as they see it as a term of protection, basically. Uh, now, there are many proposals for a solution in Syria. They vary, uh, as my colleague Joseph uh, has mentioned, they vary from you know, suggestion of having power sharing like in Lebanon or federation like in Iraq or something st similar to the Dayton Agreement or whatever. Uh, there is nothing concrete put on, you know, as a proposal to anybody, but the discussion is going how this could be ended. Uh, Assad, if he can't maintain control of the whole country, will prefer something uh, like dividing the country where he can stay uh, as a warlord in one of the rep new republics within a federation or within you know, some kind of power sharing agreement in the country. Uh, but what we need to be careful of Syri in Syria, and uh, I wrote about this uh, recently, that article which my colleague has mentioned, uh, we need to create our own solution, a solution which will not try to break the walls right now for everybody. When you build a wall around your home because of fear, I can't go and break your wall and say, no, you should not fear. Uh, you know, I'll become your enemy. What I need to do is build a bigger wall to protect everyone so your wall become, will become useless with the time and will fall down by itself. Uh, to do this, we need some kind of dynamic system. We don't want a system which will entrench us in power sharing uh, agreement, which is not flexible or will put us into some kind of division, again, which is not flexible, which not, will not uh, uh, take in mind the change which naturally happened with history. And we've seen, you know, uh, in, in Lebanon when it was created on certain power sharing agreement, with the time when the demographics have changed, this caused another civil war, a civil war in Lebanon. Uh, this will happen, could happen one day in Bosnia or anywhere else where you entrench a system uh, which can't move. So basically in my article a few days ago, and it's basically an article which I threw in just to move the discussion. It's not really necessarily the best solution. Uh, what I threw out is an idea of what I called expanded decentralization. So basically allowing people to rule themselves, but as well to decide which, uh, what regions are they like. They can come together on sectarian reasons, on ethnic reasons, or on regional reasons if they want. And by the way, in Syria historically, regional identity is stronger than sectarian or ethnic identity. It has been like this now is changing because of the common fear which is happening. So allow people to identify their areas, geographic areas, to rule themselves, to even get the powers of having their own police, having their own flag if they want, their own language in addition of the other languages, but keep the system flexible. Allow those people at any moment to re-merge together, to move together, to change their boundary as they wish. And gradually we'll see with, uh, you know, if you allow uh, peaceful coexistence, those small walls which the people build around their homes will start to fall apart. And that's very important to allow. 
uh, I'll, you know, I'll end my, uh, I'm, I'm sure I didn't go the 10 minutes, but uh, I'll end it by basically small say that we are bound to live together. It's not a choice, really. Uh, Mono-ethnic states are not possible. We can't recreate them now. We can't redo them. Uh, the price will be too high if we try. So we are bound to live together, and we have to t find ways to do that. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And uh, now our last speaker, uh, Mrs. Isra Murabit uh, from uh, Libya. Please, the floor is yours. Yay, I get to close such an impressive panel. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to top any of those, so I, I won't try. Um, but I will start by explaining a little bit about the ethnic minorities in Libya and uh, what our biggest challenges are. We don't have a lot of parallels with the Balkans in that our um, issues are not religion-based. But one of our biggest problems right now is the fact that throughout Gaddafi's role, he worked very hard not only to disenfranchise the minorities, but to essentially make them disappear. He worked very hard to, to erase them from the history books, to stop them from speaking their language, to, to disallow them from practicing their cultural aspects. So when it comes to the younger generation, our biggest problem is that we don't even know anything about them. And the unknown is threatening. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about the, the major minorities, like the Emesir, which were mentioned earlier, uh, better known in the West as Berbers, but that's kind of derogatory, because <laughs> um, barbarian. The Emesir are the original inhabitants of Libya. They make up, right now, um, anywhere between 5 and 15 percent of Libya. Nobody really knows how much. Um, but recent studies have shown that actually about 90 percent of Libyans are simply Arabized Emesir. Um, Emesir are then divided into two separate parts amongst themselves. There are northern Emesir, and then there are southern Emesir, which are called Tuareg, and they um, are nomadic across the desert. Along with the Tuareg, you also have the Tebu in the desert, and Tebu are perhaps the most uh, complex, or pose the most complex problem to Libya because they don't <coughs> really recognize national borders. They are throughout Chad, throughout Niger, throughout Sudan, into Algeria, all across the Saharan Desert. And one of their biggest issues was the fact that Libyan Tebu never signed on under the uh, Libyan Citizenship Law of 1954, which made it very easy for them to be targeted by Gaddafi, which he did numerous times. Um, they've, they've had uprisings in the early 2000s, then later on, 2008, 2009. They had some of their citizenships taken away, homes demolished, things like that by Gaddafi. And uh, so even now today, the common perception of Tebu is that they're not Libyans. They're Chadians coming into Libya through smuggling, making money off of smuggling routes and uh, taking advantage of Libya, but they're not actually Libyans themselves, when some of them are. Um, Recently, the Emesir and Tuareg tribes of Libya have announced their intention to boycott voting in the election of a committee um, that will draft the new constitution because their, um, their language is not being recognized in the current draft. Um, they've also closed down oil refineries and things like that. So rather than helping their cause, this has negatively affected most Libyans. Um, as a misunderstanding is that the Temizir language will be imposed upon all Libyans to learn in their schools rather than chosen by you know, certain districts as to whether or not they want to teach it. Uh, on the few occasions where Temizir leaders have organized themselves, their efforts have always been directed to, to the disorganized General National Congress and to the government rather than to garnering more understanding amongst Libyan people so that they have more support from the general public, being mostly Arab. So it's still seen as a hostile, um, they're trying to push, push something hostile into the, the constitution. So they're not gaining the kind of support they could be by simply explaining they want to be able to teach their own language, which they were banned <coughs> from doing under Gaddafi. Um, the way to, to, to raising that understanding amongst, amongst the general public would be, of course, explaining what it is they want exactly and why. It seems kind of odd to have an indigenous group whose country it is have to explain why they want something as basic as their language rights. 
but because of the logic, lack of education, it's, it's a necessity. Um, so Gaddafi's rewriting of history, which erased the Amazir, erased the Tuareg, and didn't give the taboo any rights to begin with, um, ha began this institutionalized discrimination <coughs> that ensued, and it wasn't sim lim limited solely to the taboo or Amazir or anybody. Um, considering and understanding the many convolutions of deviant society and the culture is perhaps the most important thing to, uh, to getting past and to, to, to moving forward from the four decades of dictatorship. Um, and it's the most important thing to building a pluralistic society. So in understanding the socio-political context in Nibia, one tool not to be overlooked, and this is something that is generally brought up as a negative, is the fact that Nibia is very um, tribal. It is a very tribal country. And that is what people stick to, more than their you know, language, because we all speak the same language, more than their religion, because we all practice the same religion. It's their tribe. It's their history. And that is typically seen as a negative thing when it shouldn't be. You know, I mean, if you look at tribes now in Nibia, they are what pro are providing security. They are what are providing justice when the militia can't be trusted. The militias can't be trusted when the government is incapable, when the legal system, the justice system, is co at a complete standstill because there's weapons everywhere. Everybody is incapable except for family, social, tribal ties. So um, what must also be understood in Nibia is that the biggest battles are not armed. And they'll likely never be. They are, again, going back to cultural issues. So the clashes that we do see are not on religious grounds, and not on a large scale, not based on ethnic divisions. And so they won't expand to the point of garnering support from the people. Right now, the, fi the fights you see in Libya are amongst groups of young men with weapons. That's it. And they don't have the support of everybody else. They have power because they have weapons, and that's it. The pros and cons of federalization. This is a discussion that has been going on in Nibia for a long time and is a little premature, again, going back to the fact that Nibians simply don't have the understanding of what federalism really means. So we've had multiple uh, <laughs> councils in the east, and I think one in the south recently, that have tried to say that they are starting their own federal state. And, you know, they've named ministers and things like that for, you know, shadow governments, things like that. But when the average Libyan hears federalism, what they're really hearing is separatism. They see it as a stepping stone towards breaking up the country, which is not what they want. So, I mean, in the latest poll, which was a few months back, uh, in the East, only 15% of people, and that's in the East, which is, you know, the, the, the federal the ones that want federalization, they have the oil, they want to be able to, to, to govern themselves, there were only 15% of people that supported federalism. Uh, in average, in the entire country, it was only 8%. So it's something that's really talked about. It is something that gets a lot of publicism. Every week, it seems, there's a new council coming out and saying they're you know, taking control of the East, but it has no public support, and thus will never move forward. And that's what we're seeing now, is we're seeing a lot of titles and no action, because nobody wants action from these guys, and you can't really do action without consent from the central government. That's where you get your money, whether you like it or not. Um, what else? Okay, I'll go on to the Dayton Agreement, although I will say that I don't know anything about the Dayton Agreement. <laughs> no? <laughs> um, no, I'll, I'll t say a little bit about it, just because it's... Um, I researched it, so I might as well, right? <laughs> it provided the answer to the Balkans because what they were looking for was conflict resolution, but it was at the cost of enabling international actors to shape the agenda of a post-war transition, which left various groups discontent <coughs> with the results. That's not what Libya is looking for. We're not looking to an end to conflict. We are looking to a beginning <coughs> to democracy. We're looking for reconciliation as our first and biggest step, which can only happen, of course, once weapons go away, but it needs to be something that happens simultaneously because weapons won't disappear unless people have trust in the people that were aggressing them and once the, the economic factors are dealt with. Okay, that's all I'll say on Dayton. <laughs> so in more tangible respects, what have we learned about Bosnia? Well, uh, 
this is a science geek in me, but uh, we've actually learned a lot and are working with the International Commission for Missing People, which is uh, based in Sarajevo, on identifying missing people and identifying those in mass graves from throughout the conflict and from the 40 years before. That's how Gaddafi chose to uh, get rid of his many bodies. So Bosnians are now working with us in Nibia on identifying many of the missing people. They're working with an organization called Mafkut, Missing, as well as the Ministry of uh, the Missing and Martyred. So that's one thing that we have definitely learned from the Bosnian experience. And then I just want to finish on kind of a more positive note as to what we can do in the future. And this is kind of my spiel at, at everything I speak at. It's just engaging the youth more. I know it sounds cheesy, but in a country where 72% of the population is under 30 years old, and if you think about under 30, that means they've only ever had Gaddafi education. The, the power of simply educating people as to the history of their country, as to the fact that they're most likely Amazigh themselves, so it makes very little sense to be fighting the rights of their own people. It is integral, not only to the growth of a, a, a democratic country, but to reconciliation itself. Because you can be a democratic country and still have divisions within that will erupt, whether on, in a political sense or in an armed sense. And to, the only way to avoid that is to fix the root of the problem. That can only be through education and understanding. And with that, I will finish. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, now we have time for short discussion. Please, uh, when you ask your questions, introduce yourselves and address your questions to the particular panelists. Please, go ahead. I was actually distraught when uh, Joseph started the depiction of the range of possibilities available from the hard type of partition that, uh, that Bosnia models to the soft type of partition that the Lebanese model proposes. In, in that respect, I was really kind of uh, relieved a little bit by what uh, Bassam suggested of the, the bigger fence. I mean, uh, what my question is as follows. As uh, alien as the, the, the Westphalian model was to the region when it was